There's nothing like a good survey to get us ready for our topic this morning, and that would be hell. Uh, it's true. <laughs> we are going to be talking about hell this morning. As I was walking in, somebody said that the building felt a little warm. I don't think that that's intentional, okay? I just want to say that off the top. It's not intentional. Well, good morning. And this morning, I want to start today by actually exploring some different comparisons, a contrast, or a opposite realities. What I want to do, I'm going to get some participation from you all. I want to say one reality and I want you to think or say out loud what the other reality is, the opposite reality. And these will be easy, I promise. There are some tricky ones that we'll get to. An example would be if I said up, you may think or say down. Okay, you've got it. Okay, let's go through a couple. If I say left, you may think right. If I say hot, you may think or say cold. If I say dog, you think of a cat. Good. Okay, here's where it starts to get a little tricky. If I said Indiana basketball, you may say... Oh, I heard a lot of things there. I'm not so sure. Purdue or UK basketball, those are maybe appropriate answers. Okay, here's another difficult one. If I say good, you think or say... You can use the same answer before. If you use UK basketball before, you can say it again. Okay, I'm not saying you don't have to. Don't, don't send me an email, okay? I'm sorry. Uh, if I say heaven, you think or say hell. Well, if you've been tracking with us over these past few weeks, then you know that we're in the middle of a sermon series entitled, What Happens When I Die? And we've been seeking to answer questions that were really formulated last summer during a Q&A series. Questions about the death of Jesus, the return of Jesus, judgment. Last week we talked about heaven. This week we're gonna take a closer look at what we refer to as hell. What's interesting is we often think of these, as, these two things as opposites, heaven and hell, and in many ways they are. But what's interesting is the Bible doesn't necessarily jump into this sort of comparison. We think, you know, where do we go when we die? Are we going to heaven or, we, or go to hell? The Bible isn't so much concerned about that. The Bible is more concerned about this comparison, heaven and earth, heaven and earth. And we see that from the opening pages of scripture. Genesis 1, chapter 1, our Bible opens up with God saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens in the earth. And we see that comparison all the way throughout scripture, all the way to Revelation 21, where we see it says, then we see a new heaven and a new earth. So the Bible doesn't seem overly concerned about heaven and hell being the comparison. It's more about this interplay between heaven and earth. And I really appreciate the way that the Bible Project guys put it. They put it this way. They say the story of the Bible, it's the story of heaven on earth being ripped into heaven and earth, followed by God's glorious mission to reunite the two realms once again. That, I think, hits at the heart of what we're trying to discuss this morning. So as we begin, begin this discussion of hell, I want to keep a couple things in mind. First, as we've already seen, our perception and understanding of hell is probably colored, maybe heavily so, by the culture around us, from art, books, Dante's Inferno, shows, music, those are the things that probably uh, fill in the blanks for what we think hell is like. And that's unfortunate because the Bible paints its own picture of what hell is like. If you picked up a copy of The Case for Heaven by Lee Strobel, it's one of the resources we've had out in the atrium. Um, it does a really good job in there. There are a few chapters that describe hell, and he, the author does a really good job explaining what some of those metaphors are and how they've impacted our sense for what hell is like. Because our view of hell, or really of anything else, shouldn't be formulated by our culture, shouldn't be impacted by our culture. That's why it's so important that we focus on abiding in God's word, staying connected to God's word, all of it, from the beginning all the way to the end, so that we can have God's mind and heart about all kinds of topics, including hell. That's what we're gonna try to do this morning. And the second thing I think is worth stating at the beginning is it's unwise and foolish to speak to things especially on this topic of hell, speak to things that the Bible doesn't speak about or to make direct statements when the Bible is a little bit more fuzzy or obscure. We have to recognize that when we think about hell that our opinions don't really matter and we probably are making assumptions at times that may not be correct. It doesn't mean that we are, but we have to be aware that we might be. And sometimes our desire for answers around a topic like this actually leads us further away from our Heavenly Father who wants us to give the answer, who is the answer. Sometimes we get so lost in trying to decipher that we forget to tremble. So when it comes to our topic this morning, you don't want to hear my opinion about it. And as you're dodging raindrops on your way home, you don't want to be just resting assured in your own uh, opinion or definition. We really want to see what God has to say. We want a biblical picture of hell. And it's been my prayer all week that God would help us through his spirit, enlighten us to the mysterious and powerful ways of God. 
And the final statement to be made before us is this. I think the reason why we compare heaven and earth, we see it as this diabolical um, opposites, is because, and we care so much about that opposition, because when we live, we walk around, we yearn for heaven in our families, in our homes, in our communities, because we see so much hell on earth, because we're so exhausted by this. We want the world to be put to rights. When we watch the news, all we see are bad things happening. And many of us have experienced those bad things. Many of us are living in those times right now. And so we ask questions about why a good God will allow this to happen. And so what I'm gonna try to do this morning is to provide a biblical description of what hell is like, as well as provide some context for why it exists and who or what ultimately ends up there. And then I wanna finish this morning just with an honest question, a question that I've wrestled with and may be appropriate for you as well. So as we begin, let's begin by asking this question. What is hell? What is hell? And here's the way I would describe it. Hell is the absence of God's presence and fellowship and blessing, and it is worse than you can imagine. It's worse than you can imagine. If you remember back to last week when we looked at what heaven was like, And we remember that heaven is this beautiful place where we get to bear God's image and we get to be everything we were made to be, fully satisfied in God's presence and being with him. I mean, James 1.17 says that our heavenly father is the giver of all good gifts. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. Well, in heaven, we get to experience all of those gifts perfectly as we enjoy God's presence permanently. Hell, on the other hand, is the full absence of God's presence full absence of his blessing and fellowship. It's the exact opposite. God's blessing and good gifts, they're not, they're not there. Not the small ones, not the big ones, none of it is there. I mean, a person in hell would not be able to experience love, experience joy, or give love, or give joy. Think about that. In heaven, we experience our full image-bearing reality as we enjoy God's fullness. In hell, people are dehumanized because the God whose image we are made is no longer present. Eternal separation from God is difficult for us to picture as human beings because we have always experienced God's blessing and his presence ever since we took our first breath. We have never lived a moment that wasn't colored by God's goodness and by his providence, whether we deserved it or not, whether we were aware of it or not. See, in hell, a person won't experience the blessings of God's presence, and we don't really even have a category for what that is like. And the biblical authors don't really have a category for what that is like. That's why when we read about hell in the Bible, our biblical authors use metaphors, something we talked about last week, to describe what hell would be like and what it would feel like. And we see descriptors all throughout Scripture. Script, uh, examples or descriptors would be things like a roaring fire, a conflagration, or smoke, or distance from God, or darkness, gnashing of teeth, worms, cats. Okay, maybe not the last one, okay? But I am allergic, and sometimes I feel like, anyway. uh, As we discussed last week, we have to be smart about the way that we read our Bibles. We have to know when to parse out when we need to read the Bible literally or figuratively, because when our biblical authors are talking about hell, they are using metaphor. And in the mind's eye of the biblical authors, they... They use metaphor, but they actually had a place in mind that brought together darkness and smoke and fire, a place that they would not want to be. And that place for them was called Gehenna, Gehenna. It was an actual place outside of Jerusalem. And it was used for a couple different reasons throughout, our, uh, throughout the biblical times. In the Old Testament, it was used as a place, it was the place that Israel kings, when they were the furthest from God, decided that they would follow foreign gods and burn up their own kids in child sacrifice. In the New Testament, those people wanted to repurpose that that land and they decided to use it as a trash dump. In both cases, it's a physical place that just modeled what it was to be distant from God and his good plan. In Old Testament times, it described what it would take to be in God's presence in the tabernacle or in the temple, and it was the state of being ritually pure and clean, I'll tell you what, the furthest place that you would want to be, the place that would leave you the dirtiest would be Gehenna. That was in the mind's eye of, this, of, of our biblical authors. It may have been the place, the model what distance from God looked like. And the biblical authors use it and refer to it, not simply to talk about a physical place outside of Jerusalem, but they were trying to really allow you to feel what it would have been like if you were walking close to that place because you would have smelled it before you would have seen it. In Old Testament, Old Testament times, you would have smelled burning flesh. 
In New Testament times, it would have been burning trash and refuse, not a place that you want to be. Paul writes in, in Corinthians that we are to be the aroma of Christ. Well, this place, Gehenna, would have been the exact opposite of that. It's the kind of smell. Have you ever had a smell or been somewhere where you want to get away from it, but you can't get away from the smell because it's in your clothes? It's in your nose? You can't escape it. That is what the biblical authors are trying to get at when they're talking about eternal separation from God and talking about Gehenna. But here's the good news. I'll put it this way. You were made for heaven. You were made for heaven, and it's better than you can, be, can believe. So you and I were made to be with God, and when God thought of a place that you could enjoy with him, it wasn't hell. It was heaven. It was this perfect place that you could enjoy his presence for all time, enjoying our heavenly father. And heaven was also a place that wasn't made just for individuals. It was made for all of us, this big C church to enjoy God's presence. And Jesus speaks to this in Matthew 16 when he's talking to Peter. Peter makes this declaration and, and then Jesus says, hey, the gates of hell, it will not pre prevail against it. So he's talking about the church. God, Jesus intentionally compares hell and the church because he wants to make it clear that hell was not cannot, will not stop the mission of Christ's church. Praise God for that. But hell was made with someone in mind. Early in the sermon series, we looked at Matthew 25 and we were talking about judgment because Jesus is, metaphorically speaking, is in the, at the last judgment is dividing the sheep and the goats. And he's taking the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And he says to the sheep on his right that they will be blessed and enjoy God's kingdom because of the way that they loved and served God the way that that was, that was modeled with the people that were around them as they loved and served other people. But in verse 41, Jesus makes this transition as he begins to speak to the goats on his left in this time of judgment. We'll pick it up there in Matthew 25, 41, where then it says, then he will say, this Jesus speaking to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Into the eternal fire prepared for, not you or me, the devil and his angels. See, hell is a real forever place designed not for us, but for the Satan, our adversary, and his followers. The devil and his demons are the ones that have abandoned God's design for them, have sought ever since to usurp God's kingdom and authority to define existence apart from God, to redefine right and wrong. They have, set, they have sought to set up their own kingdom. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. We have to recognize that when we live in sin, Contrary to God's design, then we are making a similar decision. We are choosing to rebel against God, and we're making a similar decision as Adam and Eve did in the garden. And we can see the evidence of a world gone bad, where people have decided to define existence on their own terms, to redefine what right and wrong are all about. What they're doing is they're setting up their own kingdom. We have a heavenly kingdom and an earthly kingdom. And I really appreciate the way that the Hebrew authors in chapter 10 of that letter begins to make this contrast and explain and show us, illustrate for us what a kingdom, an earthly kingdom looks like and a heavenly kingdom looks like. And he starts in verse 19, depicting what the church in the heavenly kingdom would look like. He says this. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, and that is his body, Christ's body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is a picture of what the church and God's kingdom is supposed to look like in response to what Jesus has done for us. But then notice the transition, the change in tone in verse 26. The author continues. He said, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire, notice the metaphor, that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. 
We are made for heaven, but there are two kingdoms, a heavenly kingdom and an earthly kingdom, and we are presented with a choice. And that brings me to my next point. I'll phrase it this way directly. You must make a choice, the decision of a lifetime. Each of us must choose if Christ will be our king. And if he is, that means what he says goes. Or we can then choose or choose to redefine what it means to be human, redefined good and evil. And it is this choice, it's a daily choice, it's not just a one-time time choice, it's day in, day out choice that has eternal consequences for how and with whom we will spend eternity. See, oftentimes we think of this as judgment. It's a bad word. Okay, we don't like the word judgment, but as we discussed a few weeks ago, judgment isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it can be a very, very good thing. I would say maybe one of the best things that God could do for us because God is loving and gracious enough to allow us to choose him or not to choose him. Anything else really wouldn't be love. Love as God defines it, models it, embodies it, is much deeper and much, much more costly than we ever know, could ever know. A place like hell was never made for you and me and the God who made the world and everything in it, who made you and made me, wants to show us who he is, what he is like. He wants to rescue us. Or to put it differently, he wants to make us human again. He wants to make us human again. I really appreciate the way that N.T. Wright, he's a theologian, the way he reframes this question, or reframes the choice. It's not necessarily, are we going to heaven or hell? It's a, it's a different kind of decision when we want Christ to be our king. N.T. Wright puts it this way. He says, the choice before humans could be framed differently in the form of a question. Are you going to worship the creator God and discover thereby what it means to become fully and gloriously human, reflecting his powerful, healing, transformative love in the world? We have to recognize that God made us for a reason and he made us for a certain environment. And if we as humans wanna abandon God's original design and wanna live life apart from him, then we have chosen to abandon God. We've chosen to create distance from him, which means the environment is going to change. And we see this model all throughout scripture in the Old Testament and new. And one of the examples in the Old Testament that comes to mind is the story of the account of Achan and Joshua seven in the Old Testament. Most of us are familiar with Joshua 6 because that's when Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. And we know that God wins, his people win, and that's the inaugural uh, victory in the promised land. And when they win, God tells Joshua, hey, all the plunder, it's not for you. It needs to be set apart for me because this is the first victory in the promised land. Everything else can be yours, but I want you to set apart this plunder for me. And then God instructs Joshua to take on the next city. It's much smaller, the name is I. So Joshua takes some forces over to Ai, but they are completely routed. People are left dead. And Joshua comes back to God and says, God, I, I thought you were with us, what happened? And God responds by saying, Joshua, get up. Somebody has taken the devoted things. And then God says this to Joshua. He says, unless you make this right, I will be with you no more. God is saying that if you're going to choose someone else or something else, and then you are choosing to remove yourself from God's presence, which means he can't be with you any longer. In the New Testament, we sim see similar examples in, in verbiage from Jesus in Matthew 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Towards the end of that sermon, Jesus is confronting those who feel like they're doing the right thing. They feel like they've taken a step from Achan. They're, they're doing the right things. But what Jesus is going to tell them is you're, you're doing the right things, but you're not still, you're, you're, you haven't, Christ is not your king, put it that way. You're still establishing your own kingdom. And Jesus says it this way. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many are gonna say to me on that judgment day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, Jesus says, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Two statements Two scary statements, I will be with you no more, I never knew you. Some of the most difficult words that we read in scripture be the last things we would ever wanna hear from our heavenly father. And Jesus is saying this very directly because he wants to make this point. He's making the implication that doing things for the kingdom is different, it's different than submitting yourself to the king. Don't miss that. Doing things for the kingdom is different, it's not the same thing as submitting yourself to the king. If you don't submit yourself to the king, then like Achan, like these these righteous religious leaders, then you are making the wrong choice. You are making a mistake of a lifetime. 
I appreciate the way that C.S. Lewis, in his famous work, The Great Divorce, he puts it. He's sharing again a way to think about this choice. He says, there are two kinds of people, only two, those who say, thy will be done to God. They're the ones that say, thy will be done to God. Or those to whom God, in the end, says, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, it would not be hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. If God is the giver of every good gift, then we have to assume that the choice that we have to choose him or not, that's a good choice. We're grateful for that choice. We recognize that God is good. God is true. God is love. He is full of grace and mercy and power. He is sovereign. He is just. And when we are saying those things, we're saying that God gets to define those. When we say that God is love, we're saying, God, you get to define it. And so we hold a healthy and holy tension between all of these attributes of God's character because in the end, God is God and he can do what he pleases. But to be honest, as I study this, as I think about this in my own life, I can understand all of that, but I'm still restless. I still have a question Just an honest and simple question. Maybe it's a similar question that you may have. It's just very simple. Why does hell seem so unfair? I can understand all of the rest of it, but Ryan, why does hell seem so unfair? And that's the question that I wrestle with these last few days and weeks, reading scripture, praying, like, why does it seem so unfair? As I've read and listened, I feel God is leading me back. It seems like he's always leading me back to the opening pages of scripture and a foundational truth. And it's this, that God gets to define what it means to be human. And in the opening act of God's grand story, we read that humans are made in God's image to reflect God's attributes and to continue the good work that God has started in his creative process. That's what we were made to do. That's what Adam and Eve were made to do. They were made to eat of the tree of life. And then Adam and Eve, they decided to establish their own kingdom and did not bear their father's image. And that response to us seems harsh because they're cursed forever. They're banished from the garden. And to us, that seems over the top. Okay, they chose from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They picked the wrong fruit. It seems harsh. It's a simple mistake, isn't it? But when you think about it, when you step back, It's more than just a simple mistake. It's more than just choosing the wrong fruit. What Adam and Eve were choosing to do was to commit mutiny. They were choosing to commit mutiny. And if you know the the context for what mutiny is, it's a a, a nautical term where if you're on a boat, if you're on a ship, there's a captain that's directing the ship in a certain direction and that person is in charge. But if there are people on that ship that feel like they should lead, then they begin to make a costly, serious, extreme decision to kick that captain off the ship. Somebody has to die. There can't be two captains. That's what Adam and Eve are doing. But at the same time, God's desire to make things right with Adam and Eve was equally costly, serious, and extreme because God was made man and died for us. His name is Jesus. God's response to Adam and Eve's sin, the curses, the being kicked out of the garden and God sending Jesus show us very clearly that sin is way, way more serious than we take it for, way more serious. And that's why I think the idea of hell and someone being sent there forever seems so unjust in our minds. It's because we take a light view of sin. We forget who made us and why we were made, and we forget that hell is really just the God's perfect justice for those who reject him as king, that decide to go their own way. and we go and live, we want to define the world in our own terms, right and wrong on our own terms, based on our feelings and based on our experience, a very dangerous thing. That's not how God intended it to be. And God loves us enough to grant us the choice to choose him or not, but if we choose not to pursue our heavenly father, then we have forsaken the very reason why we were made in the first place. We've decided to become unhuman in a way. Think about it this way. Let me paint a different picture. Let's say I were to walk to the back of the stage and grab a guitar and bring it to the front of the stage. Okay, I don't play the guitar. You don't want me to do that. I'm not gonna do that today. But let's say I did that. And I talked to the people that made that guitar and they're gonna say, hey, Ryan, we spent a lot of time crafting this guitar to do a very, very specific thing. It was costly, okay? It's finely tuned to do a certain thing. It's to make beautiful music. 
What if I then say, I don't, I don't wanna make beautiful music with your guitar, I wanna grab the guitar because I need, I need to do some projects at home, I need to pound nails. I don't want a hammer, I want the guitar to pound those nails. Well, the creator of a guitar is gonna say, no, 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 Ryan, you're missing it. The minute that you decide to take a guitar to pound nails, it seems foolish, but if you do that, Ryan, what you're doing is you're destroying the guitar. That guitar is never gonna have the ability to make beautiful music ever again. And I wonder if that's not unlike the decision that we make, the deception that we fall into when we decide that we're gonna take our humanity and redefine it in our own terms for our own purposes. See, when we think of heaven going to hell, or think of people going to hell forever, we cry out that God is unjust. But I wonder how we can think of that, of God being unjust, when we read Isaiah 53. So we see the prophet describing, before Jesus was ever born, what Jesus was going to have to go through. And I appreciate the message paraphrase as it puts it this way The servant, that's Jesus, grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him and thought he was scum, but the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way, and God has piled all our sins, everything that we've ever done wrong, on him, on him. This is what injustice looks like. This is justice miscarried. If anyone experienced injustice, It was Jesus. He was the one that went to hell and back so that you and I don't have to. He was the one that was on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, when we live the way that we want with zero personal consequences and we just ask our creator, our heavenly father to pick up the tab as we go and do our own way, we are the ones that are being unjust. Say it differently. If anyone has been unjust, it's me and it's you. But when we consider the sacrifice of Jesus, I think our minds and our hearts begin to soften. We begin to actually enjoy God being God, to celebrate God being God. But when we forget about the sacrifice of Jesus and what he had to went through, not just the physical pain, but the distance from God, that propitiation, taking upon the wrath of God all upon him, then when we forget that, we become hard and closed-minded and argumentative with our creator. And that's something that Isaiah the prophet also speaks to in his writings, he says this. He says, what sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it saying, stop, you're doing it wrong? Does the pot exclaim, how clumsy can you be? How terrible it would be if a newborn baby said to its father, why was I born? Or said to its mother, why did you make me this way? This is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and your creator. Do you question what I do for my children? Do you give me orders about the work of my hands? I am the one who made the earth and created people to live on it. With my hands, I stretched out the heavens. All the stars are at my command. In humility, in humility, we must remember that he is the father. We are the clay. We are the work of his hand. We must come to peace with and trust that God is and forever will be God because when we do that, when we trust and allow God to be God. Give him permission to do everything he needs to do in and through our life. We begin to remember the truth of scripture that says this, that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Or to say it differently, as Abraham says in Genesis 18, he says, will not the judge of all the earth do right? He will, he will. If you're like this, like me this morning, you may still be wrestling with questions. Questions like, do you know who's going to hell or not or are always already there? No, I don't have answers for that question. Or a question like this, what has God to do with people that have never heard about Jesus? Again, another question we're not prepared to answer this morning. And that may leave us feeling like the disciples did in John 6 after a very, very difficult 
set of teaching from Jesus and it leaves them reeling. Many of hearing this teaching from the disciples, the disciples say, hey, this is, Jesus, this is hard. Who can accept this? And aware that the disciples were grumbling, Jesus says to them, does this offend you? And then later on in John 6, we, re, we see this, that from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And Jesus says, you don't want to leave too, do you? He poses that question to the 12 and to us. And then Simon Peter, Simon Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I said at the beginning, this is a message of tears and hope. And what Peter is saying in his words that Christ has the words of eternal life, that's, that's where the hope is found. Hope that in everything, Jesus has a plan and will make a way. Hope in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Hope in the finished work on the cross and the empty tomb and the fact that Jesus is going to come again. And it leaves us with a new comparison. If there ever was a set of opposite realities that we should recognize and be grateful for, would it not be this? Sin, grace, death, life. So with this in mind, how do we live? How do we live now? Well, there are two quick things I would say. The first is this, we live expectantly. Expectant that in Jesus, everything sad is going to come true one day when he comes back and makes all things new. Expectant that the perfect love of Christ is going to cast out all fear, has the power to make things right in our world right now. And we live expectantly because like a finely crafted and tuned instrument, our lives are set up so that we can make beautiful music if we will only allow ourselves to be placed in the hand of the creator to make that beautiful music in us and through us. So we live expectantly. And the second thing I would say is we, lead, we need to live urgently because hell is not a place we wanna be. We don't wanna end up there. And so if, for some of us, if Christ is not our king then I, and we don't wanna end up there, then there are a couple things we need to do. We need to consider what Jesus has done. We need to turn back. We need to fall on our feet. And all of us, I think, need to call off the mutiny. And Christ will meet us there. And he will take us and lead us as only he can. And for those of us that feel like and believe that Jesus really is our, he's our champion, he's our king, he's our captain, then there is a world that needs to hear from us, see in us what the good news, what the gospel of Christ is all about. And our prayer, no matter where we find ourselves, should be that God help us to live in love like your son Jesus. That's the only way to live. That's the only way to be human. And so why wait? Let's go to him with that request right now. Heavenly Father, in humility we come to you cognizant of the fact that we have fallen short, that we have treated you indifferently, that we are willing to be too close to sin. So Father, forgive us for that. But Father, thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus hope that we have in Jesus, that heaven was made with us in mind, that we get to enjoy that sweet partnership and walk with him because of the finished work of the cross and the empty tomb. And so we pray, come Lord Jesus, we need you and we love you. And we offer this prayer in Jesus' name.